Putin has presented the West with a promissory note that the latter is hardly able to mow down. But first, let's take apart the presidential program of the country's development, which is impressive and inspiring, and let the whiners continue to whine on the sidelines. The address to the Federal Assembly is, in fact, the very presidential program. This program to develop the country and improve people's lives looks very ambitious in terms of costs, especially in the context of an increased defense budget. Therefore, many people have the question of where the funds for its realization will come from. And here in the interview with Dmitry Kizilev, this question was the first one. To quote, turning to, with your message, you have figuratively taken trillion after trillion out of your sleeve, thus offered an absolutely marvelous plan for the development of the country. Absolutely amazing. It's a different Russia, with a different infrastructure, a different social system, just a dreamland. It makes me want to ask, ask your favorite question from Vysotsky. Where's the monies in? Did we earn them at all? End of stats. The president responded that this plan is the result of painstaking work of the expert community and government specialists and will be supported by revenues. And it is not secured some expert optimists believe that there should be and will be more income. Which means, as in the previous six years, when 8 trillion rubles was planned to be allocated for the development of the social economy from 2018, and then the expenditures were increased. It is likely that this time too, the planned expenditures will be increased in various directions. Now let's talk about the projects and plans that have made the most positive impression on me. A grandiose project to build the Jubga Sochi Highway. Those who have traveled by car to Sochi will not give a lie that the endless proud serpentines going from Jubga to Sochi are so physically exhausting and take so much time that many people have no desire to go to either Sochi or Abkhazia, and they go to Galenzik, Navarasisk, or Anapa. Therefore, the new highway is a much needed and at the same time very challenging project. The sequel follows. The total length of the four-lane highway will be 171 kilometers. Its construction will cost about one and a half trillion rubles. The highway is scheduled to be paved by the end of 2029. Many people have already started to question why it will cost such a huge amount of money, as if not realizing that most of the road will consist of many bridges over rivers and gorges and several long tunnels. The only disadvantage of this highway for motorists will be that it will be a toll road as it is an understudy of the existing highway. However, hopefully, the price will not be prohibitive and people will still have a choice to take the toll road quickly or the free one, but already less busy, long and tedious. Yes, toll roads do not please many people, but still it should be understood that the funds invested by the state in this project should be returned so that later it would be possible to invest them in other projects in our huge country and so that it would not be necessary to allocate funds from the budget for the maintenance of this highway and the provision of additional services in the future because it is not rubber and with such an active growth of the road network, as is happening now. In Russia, it will simply break. Let's move on. Changes in the structure of GDP. Here's what the president had to say about it. Quote, the economy is growing. That's a fact. And the fact that is recorded not by us, but by international economic financial organizations. We have indeed overtaken the Federal Republic of Germany in purchasing power parity, taking its place, the fifth largest economy in the world. If things continue to develop at the pace they are today, we have a good chance of taking Japan's place from the country to become the fourth economy of the world and in the not too distant future." End quote. So far, there is a difference between our economies. The structure of our country's economies, it compares favorably with ours. We still have a lot to do to ensure that not only in terms of purchasing power parity, but also in terms of GDP per capita, we have a decent position. One, and also that the structure itself changes so that it becomes much more efficient, more modern, and more innovative. The president's goal is to significantly increase the labor shortage, workitization of production, which will reduce the need for migrant workers. Accordingly, the training of engineering personnel is also increasing. We have now launched 30 state-of-the-art engineering schools across the country. This year, we are launching 20 more and there will be 50 and another 50 are scheduled to launch in the coming years. Let's move on. The West will not succeed in dragging us into an arms race and wearing us down like they did with the Soviet Union. We also realize that the West is trying to drag us into an arms race, thereby wearing us down and repeating the trick that the Soviet Union succeeded them in the 1980s. Let me remind you that in 1981 to 88, the Soviet Union's military expenditures amounted to 13% of GDP. Therefore, our task is to develop the defense industrial complex in such a way as to increase the scientific, technological, and industrial potential of the country. I won't refer to our statistics, let's refer to the Stockholm Institute. Last year we had defense spending at 4%, and this year, we have 6.8%. So we're up 2.8%. 8%. In principle, this is a noticeable increase, but absolutely not critical. It has to be said that defense spending does something to accelerate the economy. 
they make her more energetic. But there are limits here, of course. And the age-old question arises, which is more profitable, guns or oil? Although our modern defense industry is good in that it not only indirectly influences civilian industries, but also itself, using the innovations needed for defense, uses these innovations to produce civilian products. This is an extremely important thing. The president said that the funds invested by the U.S. in its defense are literally disappearing like in a black hole, and reminded that although our defense budget is nine times smaller than the U.S. budget, it is more than enough to calmly confront our eternal rival. For example, our nuclear triad, unlike the U.S., is almost 95% updated. While the U.S. still has Soviet developments, i.e., missiles created during the Soviet Union, and one missile system Avangard, with planning hypersonic, with an intercontinental range block, zeroed out all the enormous resources that the Americans had invested in their missile defense system for several decades, and they persist in investing in this system. They plan to spend $24 plus billion dollars on it in 2023 alone, and that's about a third of Russia's entire defense budget in 2023. So it looks like we're the ones who got the US into an arms race that makes no sense to them. As a result, they have to spend several times more money than we do. While having a budget deficit, a negative trade balance, and a huge debt that managed to grow by $0.5 trillion in just two months of this year. Now let's move on to the fact that Putin has presented the West with a promissory note that the latter is hardly capable of repaying. In the same interview with Dmitry Kaislyov, Vladimir Putin paid much attention to the issue of potential negotiations with the West over the Northern Black Sea region. At first glance, this might even seem somewhat unexpected, but the topic is indeed becoming more and more relevant and is increasingly heard in the public sphere. Which means it's time to make Russia's position as clear as possible, which is what the president has done. The unpleasant reality of the situation on the front line for the West is reaching more and more of the people on the other side. This has very legitimate consequences. The voices demanding an agreement with Moscow are growing louder. Moreover, while initially they were mostly marginal figures who were very conveniently labeled as Russian agents or useful idiots of the Kremlin, now the same is being said by the most mainstream and highly influential forces, media, think tanks, politicians and statesmen, up to and including the Pope. This view has not yet become dominant there and still meets with impressive resistance, but it's no longer marginalized. And judging by the way events are developing in the Northern Black Sea region, the moment when it will become predominant is not very long away. However, these changes worry the politically active, patriotic part of Russian society. The reason is obvious. People fear that in the course of negotiations Russia will lose the gains for which our soldiers are paying with their blood and lives. Either we will simply be deceived by the West, as it has done so many times in the past, or, maintaining a pro-Western orientation, a part of the domestic elites will be inclined to make concessions, surrendering our military victory. And no one is immune from mistakes and failures in the negotiation process, even the most ardent patriot of his country. This is probably why the president made extensive and detailed comments on the issue, touching on very different aspects affecting Russia's position. And this answer is primarily for us, the citizens of the country. But it could also be very useful for the West if there are still enough intelligent and qualified people there who can hear and understand what is being said, rather than making up their own version of Putin's answer according to their agenda and personal beliefs. And that's been a growing problem lately. Well, for the insufficiently nationalized representatives of the domestic establishment, who harbor hopes of bringing back mincemeat, the president's answer is also very useful and makes them understand that it is not worth dreaming of unfulfilled dreams. The West in the form of the 404 country as anti-Russia has prepared a very powerful weapon against our country. However, when it still didn't work as expected, he had to openly enter the war himself. And that was his huge, downright fatal mistake, because it turned on our nation's domestic warfare mode. Putin said that the deep Russian society and ordinary citizens have long waited for their demand, the country and the state. And the West's war against us was precisely the situation that turned on the mechanism of national consolidation. This means that the state, backed by strong and active militant, literally popular support, has its hands free. He is not under pressure from public opinion to end the fighting at all costs and as soon as possible. On the contrary, citizens believe it is right to solve the issue radically, eliminating the threat to Russia in the southwestern direction once and for all. Which means the operation can continue. For as long as it takes until the West is not just ripe for negotiations, but reaches the point of hearing Moscow's position and accepting its terms. Well, I mean surrender. Now, this could take a lot more time.
By the way, the president's words make it clear why Russian officials are so actively peddling the theme of deception by the West, which Moscow has faced many times in recent decades. It is not uncommon to hear criticism of this position, saying that it makes Russia look weak and stupid. However, it is one that has now provided the state with an extremely comfortable and strong negotiating position. What are your guarantees, gentlemen? Since the old and, alas, unkind principle of gentlemen take a gentleman's word for it broke down definitively, Putin emphasized that the West will not just have to offer Russia guarantees of compliance with the agreements, but these guarantees must be spelled out, must suit Moscow, and the Russian leadership must actually believe in them. That is, the West should have to take some action, essentially, in the realm of reputation and moral authority. The West finds itself in exactly the same situation as with the U.S. debt, which is storming to astronomical heights and whose mere servicing is increasingly upsetting the financial system. Everyone has already realized that it is just a pyramid scheme, but it is still holding on and the world is watching with curiosity, though not without anxiety about the consequences, to see what will be the pebble that will start the collapse. Well, by demanding guarantees in the negotiations, Putin has shaken the pebble of another tower, the Tower of Babel, of the Western elite. Mesomeria and lies. Perhaps this is understood by the American and European hawks who are now actively pushing the topic of the need to bring in a Western contingent, realizing that Moscow will not be able to sell or deceive it in the negotiations. They see direct involvement in the conflict as the only remaining option to try to reduce the conflict to an outcome more or less acceptable to NATO countries. However, Putin also had words for these hotheads, in particular the word interventionists. And the president explicitly stated that it was as an interventionist that he could not be blamed. This year, we will be looking at the competition to Russian territory, and we will rate the entry of Western troops into the Northern Black Sea region. And I would like to remind you that our country has a rich experience of successfully solving this problem, which is worth remembering for everyone in the West. Essentially, for 04 has become a conflict in which the bankruptcy of Europe and the states, militarily, morally, economically, threatens to become from expected to actual. In his interview, Putin presented the West with a promissory note, which the latter is in principle unable to repay.